This video is a response to questions from a few friends regarding the interpretation of Sam Tatum's evolutionary ideas. Here are our responses, for reference. Question 1. The website TV Tropes was mentioned earlier. It seems that people in Europe and America enjoy this systematic sharing or summarizing. Do Chinese people have a similar systematic organization or summarization in other fields? Response. TV Tropes is a comprehensive collection of plots in movies and TV shows, essentially a plot function library where writers can directly draw inspiration. The idea here is that stories not only have fixed structures but also consist of fixed elements. As long as you change the attire a bit, the audience will still resonate. This systematic summarization in a field, using a literary term, is known as deconstruction. It reveals that what seems like a whole is just a combination of common elements, not as mysterious as it appears. China is a rising force in modern technology, but there's one field we've understood for a long time. Examinations. If you want to apply for a PhD in the United States, universities usually require you to take a test called the GRE. It's organized by a private company called ETS and holds considerable authority. The GRE isn't about testing your professional knowledge but your intellectual level. Over 20 years ago, the GRE consisted of verbal, math, and analytical writing sections. Now it includes analytical writing, verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, verbal reasoning, and an experimental section. Chinese test takers had already deconstructed this GRE exam. Logic and math are strengths for Chinese science and engineering students, so there's not much to say there. The key lies in verbal reasoning. Over 20 years ago, the main purpose of the verbal reasoning section was to test your vocabulary. It involved analogies and fill-in-the-blank questions with obscure words, akin to Chinese people using rare characters in couplets. ETS had a simple idea. These words are not part of common people's daily language. If you not only know them but can also use them proficiently, it indicates an exceptional reading volume and high intelligence. Now, imagine this. The default test takers for these types of questions are Americans, and Chinese students are at a disadvantage. We can't possibly read obscure English literature all the time, isn't that akin to forcing foreigners to read classical Chinese? However, ETS didn't anticipate that, Chinese test takers turn GRE verbal reasoning into a strength. The reality is that the English vocabulary is limited, and there are only so many interesting words worth using in the GRE exam. We first created a GRE vocabulary encyclopedia and then developed computer-based training for rapid response. Spend a few hundred hours, memorize these words, get accustomed to various question types. Easy. As a result, even though Chinese students might have limited actual English reading abilities, their test scores significantly surpassed those of American students. Of course, ETS tried some methods, like keeping previous test questions confidential, but these couldn't stump Chinese researchers in exam strategies. So, eventually, ETS had to change the GRE format. Question 2. Customization is a form of manipulation. When customized, it should make you feel a bit uncomfortable. How can we judge which customizations we don't need to worry about too much, and which ones require us to be customized? Where are the boundaries? Response. Most people choose to accept the defaults offered by businesses or institutions because they may not be sensitive enough to identify potential issues. Many reject being customized due to a psychological desire to defend their sense of control. Both attitudes have their drawbacks. For example, when dining at a restaurant, if the waiter suggests a set meal and you just want a satisfying meal without expecting a unique experience, I recommend going with the suggestion. What they recommend may not be the absolute best or perfectly suited to you, but it certainly won't be subpar. To avoid ending up with something you don't like, you'd have to put in effort, which you might not want to do. However, if you care deeply about the matter, you must understand that defaults, even with good intentions, are only the most suitable options for the average person. 
The reality is that, no one is average. Everyone has unique needs and habits. When buying a new TV, the manufacturer may have placed the most commonly used channels and apps on the homepage with good intentions. If you watch TV frequently, the first thing you should do is delete channels you don't use and place your most used apps on the homepage. Your reward will be a smoother and more efficient experience. It's not about opposing businesses. It's about having your customization simply, because, you, are unique. Question, 3. Experiencing the, emptiness of the mind, where all external experiences are products of our cognition, does this mean that, the general laws governing human experiences of, the external world are objective? Response. This depends on your definition of, objective. If by objective, you mean that, given the same situation, different people will have roughly the same experiences, and these experiences follow predictable and relatively stable patterns worthy of summarizing, learning, and emulating, then yes, that is the case. Otherwise, behavioral science would be meaningless. However, we must also note that, even in the same situation, different people may have different experiences. For instance, a foreigner visiting China for the first time, experiencing barbecue in Zebo, will have impressions, concerns, and memorable things vastly, different from a Chinese person accustomed to barbecue. Moreover, if I have red-green color blindness and you have normal vision, our experiences of the same red color would be entirely different. In other words, experiences are closely tied to a person's prior life experiences. Of course, the equation, personal history plus current situation equals experience follows a pattern and can be considered objective. But if, objective, means, true and entirely comprehensive, then the objectivity of experiences has its limits. Beyond those limits, all laws regarding experiences, become subjective. The experiences of animals, for instance, differ significantly from human experiences. We've previously recommended the book, An Immense World. How Animal Senses Reveal the Hidden Realms Around Us by science journalist Ed Young, which explores fascinating animal experiences. Take color, for example. Human eyes can perceive visible light with wavelengths between 360 nanometers and 830 nanometers. We can't see longer wavelength infrared light or shorter wavelength ultraviolet light directly, but many animals can. The left side of this image shows how a flower appears to human eyes, and the right side shows how it appears to a bee. You might think the image seen by human eyes is clearer, but it lacks a crucial detail. A central area in the flower only visible, in the ultraviolet spectrum, a color deeper than what human eyes can perceive. This area serves as a target for the bee, making it easy to aim at. The same applies to the flower in this image. The left side shows the ultraviolet view, and the right side shows the visible light view. Perhaps because the act of bees pollinating benefits both flowers and bees, flowers evolved this feature to attract bees. We, as humans, would never know about this without instruments. We also can't experience the sense of familiarity and purpose a bee feels when seeing a flower. But bees aren't the exception. Many insects, birds, fish, reptiles, including rodents, and bats among mammals, and even elephants, can see ultraviolet light. Humans are the exception. Or rather, every species is unique. There are known fish species capable of generating electricity. The electric eel, for instance, can discharge a high voltage of 860 volts, enough to stun a horse. It employs electricity as a hunting weapon. Can you imagine the experience of having the ability to generate your own electricity? Some fish use electrical signals to communicate with each other. A mosquito's taste system isn't located on its mouth but on its feet. When it lands on your skin, it can immediately taste your scent with its feet. Some animals can perceive magnetic fields and use Earth's magnetic field to guide migration. The well-known echolocation in bats allows them to navigate their surroundings using sound instead of light. We can discuss these mechanisms, but we can never experience the experiences of those animals. No matter how you think about it, you can never truly feel what it's like to be a bat.
So, all experiences are subjective. Question 4. We've discussed a lot about behavioral design and touched upon Kant's moral philosophy. My question is, are these two contradictory, and if so, how should we navigate through them? Response. This is indeed a worthy question. Businesses use behavioral design to attract consumers to purchase their products or services, a method that, strictly speaking, Kant might frown upon. Kant's moral law demands that our actions be based on principles rather than outcomes, and these principles must be something you wish to be a universal law. For example, if you download a pirated movie, you might know it's not ideal, but you think it doesn't hurt much. After all, even without the pirated version, you wouldn't go to the cinema, and the legal channels might not have the movie. You consider taking this small advantage acceptable. However, Kant would argue that if you wouldn't want everyone in the world to do the same, your action is unethical. But you might argue, I usually spend money on legitimate content. If everyone followed my example and only consumed a certain percentage of pirated content, the film industry would still survive. In fact, despite so many people watching pirated content, the film industry is still thriving. Kant would reply, I don't look at the results. I only look at the principle. If the action doesn't align with the principle, it's wrong, regardless of the proportion or the results. In simple terms, if you can't imagine a world where everyone acts based on the same principles, and yet the world still functions normally, then your action is unethical. According to Kant, actions like deceiving passengers by making them walk longer to reduce pure waiting time at airports or businesses intentionally adding excessive sugar and fat to food, attracting consumers while disregarding the increased risk of obesity in society, are immoral. Practices like game companies using variable rewards to make players addicted are considered a decline in humanity. Viewed through Kant's lens, the core-driven modern economic system of profit-maximizing capitalism is inherently problematic. To maximize profits, businesses bend over backward to provide consumers with immediate satisfaction, ignoring long-term benefits, let alone ethical responsibilities. Kant might sorrowfully point out that, Issues like environmental pollution and community decay in modern society are consequences of immoral business practices. However, if we relax Kant's principle over results stance and examine the real outcomes of economic development, we might find more confidence in the world. Capitalism has gone through periods of extreme pollution and harsh worker conditions, but overall, it has improved, especially in developed nations, with advancements in environmental protection and welfare that Kant could never have imagined. What happened? Kevin Kelly suggests it's due to technological progress. If humanity still heavily relied on burning coal for heating, the world wouldn't have improved. Fortunately, we invented electricity and found ways to generate it without burning coal. In retrospect, maybe the coal-burning phase was an unavoidable cost. Kant would argue, I don't inquire about results. Results are uncontrollable, and people at that time had no way of knowing electricity might be invented in the future. Indeed, Kevin Kelly's viewpoint isn't a logical argument. It's a form of confidence. Confidence not only in technology but also in the people of the future to create new methods to address new problems. So, is it, if you know it's unethical, never do it, or issues of development should be resolved through development? There's no definitive answer here. It depends on each individual's response based on specific circumstances. If you feel there is value in this, please like, subscribe to this channel, and leave your thoughts or suggestions in the comments section. Let's grow together and read more good books.